Okay, thank you very much, everybody. So um, we set out on this mission to try and connect small scale stuff to climate. And today we're going to see that through um, with some quantitative detail. Um, and let me hide the meeting controls. So that's the target. And so for those of you who went to the public talk, I showed this little movie. And I want to come back to this in the end, and I want to also talk about some of the quantitative elements of this as we think about this piece of the story. So this is a movie of, a, of an ocean model and the atmospheric conditions that are forcing it. So the blue pulses are when the atmosphere is cooling the ocean, and the red pulses is when the atmosphere is warming the ocean. This teal line is a temperature surface at the, the temperature uh, ISO line at the surface. And this green contour is the mixed layer depth, the depth of that boundary layer. And so what you see is that there's lots of interesting weather and the ocean is not moving very much. You can look, things do slowly evolve, but on this kind of days ticking by at that rate, it's not a whole lot of activity. But if you speed up the, if you speed up the process, now you see that it's a turbulent ocean and the turbulent ocean, what looks like a stochastic atmosphere above. So there's a time scale separation between the atmospheric dynamics and the ocean dynamics. There's a length scale separation for all the reasons we've been talking about. The deformation radius is larger in the atmosphere. The density is different between the atmosphere and the ocean. But also all of these eddying phenomena are part of the processes that govern that uptake of energy, both on the atmosphere side and the ocean side. So that's the part that's challenging to get right. That's the part we'll see in a second that has to do with the, the budget. And so this idea that the oceans are slow and they're rectifying or reddening a high frequency stochastic atmosphere above is the central piece of the Hasselman 2021 Nobel Prize, which, and we're gonna come back to that in the end. So for today, we're gonna start to think about a budget an energy budget. But before we get there, we're going to finish off our story of how small scales make their way into a global climate model. Small ocean scales make their way into a global climate model. So since we can only afford one teragrid or a little, you know, a few tens of teragrids, we can get to the mesoscale permitting models that have some of the biggest mesoscale eddies, but we don't have any sub mesoscale or any Langmuir turbulence directly represented. So I'm quickly going to go through what you do if you're truncating in the middle of a cascade and what you do if the phenomena is smaller than the grid scale as far as a numerical modeling perspective for those pieces. Along the way, we're going to have a chance to talk about how the global cycle of kinetic energy works, kind of harkening back to the Smagorinsky and Leith story that we talked about yesterday of the cascades. Then we're going to talk about the sub mesoscales and how they affect the mixed layer and the wind driven turbulence, wave driven turbulence affects the mixed layer. So that's picking up our small scale stuff. And then the last piece is how does the mixed layer then in turn affect this global energy budget? Or is it a, a it's something that measures it? So I mean, talked about this in the public lecture, but I'll just remind folks what are some of the things we would care about about the oceans if we're thinking about climate? Well, we care about sea level rise, <laughs> that's one. We also care about the Earth's energy balance, and those two are intimately related because of the thermal expansion of the density of seawater. So like I explained it in the public talk, sea level rise happens because you put, the volume of the ocean is too big for the basin it's in. It gets more vol voluminous. It could get more voluminous by adding more mass or by decreasing the density and therefore taking up more volume per unit mass. So when you melt ice on land, you're increasing the mass. When you're warming, you're expanding, you're decreasing the density. We also are very interested in the Earth's carbon balance and ocean acidification. And those pieces, I'm not gonna talk about too much today, but the processes that lead to uptake of carbon, which if you don't listen to the biologists, the vast majority of the ocean uptake of carbon is chemical, not biological. It's just, aqueous CO2 being absorbed and then reacting into the other chemical constituents, carbonate and bicarbonate. Then after that, critters with shells use that to make their shells, 
but that's not on the climate time scale that those are effects are felt. So when you take up heat, you also might absorb and the conditions at the surface of the ocean, if the ocean is colder, it takes up more heat. And if it's colder, it actually also absorbs more carbon dioxide. Cold water can hold more dissolved gases than warm water. And so it goes together. So these two on a process basis are actually intimately linked to each other. And then you might say, well, would the currents or the stratification change? And if so, that's gonna affect all this other stuff. And so that's kind of the question of ocean modeling. So I showed this global energy inventory. So this is of the excess energy that's in the Earth's system from global warming, right? Global warming is like a blanket. The energy of the sun is not affected that much, but the outgoing radiation is caught by the extra carbon dioxide and water vapor in the atmosphere. Where does that extra energy go? It goes into the ocean. So surface ocean, mid-depth ocean, deep ocean, 90% of the art of the energy that we've measured, excess energy. And then this little bit down here is melting ice, warming the land and warming the atmosphere. So global warming in terms of the one degree C that we're worried about, as far as atmospheric warming is in that little wedge down there. Okay. We're talking about processes, we're talking about sea level. Let's skip over that. Okay. So let's get to the way that we think about this. So this is really just an energy balance for the Earth system. So in comes the sun. Some of it bounces off the clouds. Some of it bounces off the surface. That's about 102 versus 341. 161 watts per meter squared is absorbed by the surface which could be land or ocean, depending. And then that heats up stuff and the hot stuff does basically black body radiation and the black body radiation goes out, but maybe it gets absorbed again and it goes back. <laughs> and so there's this circuit that's going up and down and up and down. These are huge numbers. These numbers are actually bigger than that number. So the back radiation from the atmosphere and clouds is actually almost as much heat coming to the surface as the sun which is why in the winter time on a cloudy night, it might actually be quite warm. It's because of this back radiation effect. Anyway, um, but some of it makes its way through and then it heads out. And what happens to greenhouse gases is that they affect this part and block what goes out from the atmosphere, either being emitted by the warmth of the atmosphere or this passage coming through directly from the surface through the atmosphere now. So if you look 341 minus 102 minus 239 is actually zero, but 341.3 minus 101.9 minus 238.5 is just under a watt. So that's global warming. It's a watt per meter squared. It's about a third of a percent signal on the incoming energy from the sun. Yeah, well, they, yeah, so these didn't used to be measured. Now we can measure them with specialized satellites for each of them. Um, and so it's just an incoming, incoming energy, outgoing energy, change in temperature, heat capacity. Okay, not terribly complicated thermodynamics. And so we said all of the excess energy is ending up in the ocean. So what does that mean? So that heat capacity, that's ocean. That's the heat capacity of the ocean is what we're talking about there. And it's not even the heat capacity of the whole ocean. It's really the heat capacity mostly of the upper ocean. And so you might say, why is that? Well, it's because seawater is about a thousand times more massive than air. And in addition, seawater takes up about four times its heat, capa its heat capacity per unit mass is about four times as big as well. So 3.4 meters of the ocean has the same heat capacity as the whole atmosphere or the whole dry atmosphere. And that's about a little less than one one thousandth of the ocean depth. So the ocean has a lot more room to store energy for the same temperature rise compared to the atmosphere. It also, um, the land also has a pretty high heat capacity. It's not as high as, as the ocean, but when you heat land, you only heat the top. It doesn't like get in very well. It has to conduct through a relatively insulating material. Whereas if you heat the surface of the ocean and there's winds, you mix it up. So you're actually not heating just the surface, you're heating many hundreds or thousands of meters depending on your time scale. 
So part of the process here we're thinking about is how much heat gets in into how deep of an ocean on what time scale, and that will help us understand how this energy budget is going to relate the energy imbalance, which we are saying it comes from greenhouse gases, to a, a rate of warming. Okay, so this is one of the key things that climate models do. And a lot of people will tell you climate models don't work very well. So this is a nice little movie talking about some of the classic climate models published back in the 70s and 80s versus the temperature that's been absorbed, observed since. So most of the time people will tell you climate models are not very good because you're pre predicting the future and the future hasn't come yet. So how will we know if they're any good? Now we've been doing this for 50 years. We can actually look back and see how well the 50 year record worked. And so let me run that one more time. As you might anticipate, um, the early ones were kind of crummy, pretty simple. So Wally Brokers is the first one that gets shown on here. Um, but Jim Hansen, and then another from Jim Hansen that's getting more interesting. And then the first IPCC report, the second report, the third report, essentially they're holding within this internal variability range that we expect. What are these little wiggles? They're things like El Nino years, which the planet might be anomalously warm for a year or two. La Nina year is the opposite. And so you can break down the uncertainty about forecasts into a couple of different categories. There's that El Nino versus La Nina, which if you took the standard deviation, it's about as big as this orange line. There's the scatter among models which is a measure of how well we understand all the processes. So the scatter among models is this blue line. And then there's uncertainty about what humans will actually emit. And that's the green envelope. When you say scattering among models, there's some control in your mind about what, how to keep it from being scattered. Is that strongly to this case? Yes, there, is, there are a few very powerful negative feedbacks that planetary energy balance, like if you crank up the temperature of the earth, the outgoing black body radiation goes up really fast, T to the fourth. So pretty much nothing else competes with that for big temperature excursions. But for small temperature excursions, then you say, oh, is there a positive feedback from melting sea ice? Or is there a negative feedback from growing, you know, changing the color of the land surface, like which winds. So there are a lot of competing positive and negatives in the nearby temperature range. In the long temperature range, there's some, there's, we know that there's a big stabilizing effect if we get out that far. So we can't go that far, but these models don't go that far. They're actually quite a bit narrower than that. Now you could say, oh, if I only had an infinite resolution model, it would do something totally different because all these models are still constrained by the same computational and understanding that I talked about the first two days. So they're not that different, but they're at least our best guesses is what the best way to do it is. But so the biggest uncertainty by the time we get up to 2100 is actually what humans are gonna admit, not what the physics is. And it turns out that actually, if the same person who made that movie revisited it in a peer reviewed paper uh, a couple of years ago with a, with a team and they found that if you correct those initial forecasts for their poor assumptions about what humans were going to do, they're even better than they were in that movie. Those scatter around the future actually had more to do with mistakes about what humans were gonna do than it did about the physics of the underlying problem. Both, <laughs> depending, on which, depending on which study. <laughs> okay, so that's, touching on the energy story, which we're gonna come back to at the very end. And I'm gonna show you how the small scales actually feed into that energy story. But now we're gonna talk about small scales for, for the intervening bit. Okay, so what do we do if we have the biggest computers around, we can resolve some mesoscale and we set it up. Well, the mesoscale is as far down this pipe as we can afford to go right now. So maybe we have a 25 kilometer grid or a 10 kilometer grid resolving those big hundred, couple hundred kilometer eddies. So we don't get all of them. Like the model I showed, the two kilometer model does a pretty good job of getting all of them, but we're kind of somewhere in the middle. So somewhere in the middle, we're really thinking about a large eddy closure kind of thinking from a numerical perspective. So let's think about what that would, what could we, how could we do that? 
So remember, we have eddies, small Rossby number, large Richardson number, small Froude number, full depth, 100 kilometer scale, months, baroclinic and barotropic instability. There are parameterizations of that, which is what we'd use in the coarse resolution model, but those are not large eddy closure style parameterizations. Those assume there are no eddies resolved. Okay. Here's they are. Sorry, reusing a slide. Okay. So we talked about a 3D turbulence cascade. And there's dissipation here on the viscous scale. So this is millimeter scale in the ocean. This forcing we are imagining is maybe global scale. <laughs> and if there could be a 3D turbulence cascade from one to the other, we wouldn't have to know much more than the forward energy cascade from that climate scale down to start thinking about how to parameterize things. We know we can't use the 3D because the ocean's only four kilometers deep and 10,000 kilometers wide. So it's not 3D turbulence, it's quasi 2D. We need to make that correction in a second. But I wanna show you that there's a very clever thing that Smagorinsky did. And I'm gonna go through the logic that Smagorinsky used or my Reader's Digest version of his logic. What if your grid scale is somewhere in between the, the dissipation scale and the forcing scale? If this is the grid scale of your model, you'd like to preserve the same amount of energy flow from the forcing toward dissipation, but maybe you just change your viscosity to dissipate it right here so that it's the same epsilon, but instead of cascading all the way down here, it stops up here. So if you go through the logic of that, which I'll show in a second, you can write down a scale a viscosity scale that depends on the strain rate, the square root of the strain rate squared. And it depends on the grid scale. And there's one dimensionless parameter, and that gives you a, a variable viscosity. Oh, yeah. It's a cool, it looks cool. It looks cool. <laughs> totally. Okay. So here's the two minute version of how Smagorinsky came up with this idea. And I will just note that if you want to write a highly cited paper, you can still explain it two minutes at the end. It's been cited almost 20,000 times, this paper. And anyway, here's the idea. We have this flux across scales. It's going from the sources, cascading, and then being dissipated. So there's epsilon source, epsilon cascade, epsilon being dissipated. What does that look like in our spectral energy balance equation that we talked about last time? We have the rate of change of energy at a given scale. This scale is this K star is where I'm examining, which has to equal the flux of energy across that scale plus minus the dissipation on all the scales from zero up to where we are, plus the sources on all the scales from zero up to where we are. So basically, I'm just saying it's force dissipated balance, but if it's not, then you grow energy at the scale where you, where you dump it out. And then there's a flux across scales. This is just that. There's the, the idea of the Kolmogorov wave number, which normally would be calculated with a real viscosity. And this is just dimensional analysis that says if you have this epsilon and you want to know the wave number at which it becomes order one, this is the only length scale you can form out of a viscosity and epsilon. So that's the Kolmogorov scale. But we're going to change the viscosity. So we get a different Kolmogorov scale. We don't know what it is yet, but we have that formula when we're, re when we're ready. And then the other thing we're going to say is instead of having this flux across scales we saw up there, throw that away and just say all viscous flux when we hit this wave number. So now this is an equation which has viscosity and something complicated. We can actually, rather than doing this in spectral integral over wave numbers, we can realize what the, the, in the physical space, what it would be, it's just viscosity times the strain rate double contracted on average over the whole domain. This is something that depends on resolved flow parameters and viscosity, which equals this, which we could plug into that formula. If we did that, we'd have something that only depends on wave number viscosity and this known parameter of the strain rate. 
and we just solve it. And that gives us the viscosity that I just showed you. So it's the viscosity is, there's the grid scale or the resolved wave number. There's the strain rate, which is just that thing. And that's all it does. Okay, so where, so now if Nigel were here at this moment, he should be yelling because there is no epsilon. He talked about the intermittency correction. This neglects the intermittency correction. And this is the globally averaged value of this, assuming homogeneity. We then replace the global average of a homogeneous field with a local estimate of something that is definitely not homogeneous. So we just broke a couple of really crazy things that we probably should not have done. So you can still get cited 18,000 times and be wrong in two important ways, but be having produced something that's really practically useful. And the reason why this is practically useful is because if the model wants to blow up, it's gonna make a whole lot of strain rate as it's like exploding. And what does this do in response? If this goes up, the viscosity gets bigger. So it's self-regulating. <laughs> essentially. So what a constant viscosity model will blow up, this one won't under the same circumstances because the viscosity goes up as the model tries to go numerically unstable. So it's a very powerful regular, regularizer on a numerical system. Okay, but we said we don't have 3D turbulence. We have 2D turbulence. So can we do this for the 2D Creighton and Cascade? Sure, you can go through exactly the same argument. And now we resolve some of the eddies and this is the eddy injection scale as I explained last time. So our grid has is smaller scale than that. If we were up here in the inverse energy cascade, we actually could use the Smagorinsky scheme, but then we wouldn't resolve the eddies and that would be weird. But down here, the eddies are cascading down, but they're cascading their instrophy down. You go through the same argument and you come up with this, which is what Chuck Leaf did in 1996. And we showed that that works nicely. But the world, the ocean actually isn't really 2D. It has these convergences and divergences. And so the problem with this formula is that it only notices vertical vorticity, doesn't know anything about divergences. So if you use this in a model that's 3D and can converge and diverge in the horizontal, it actually has gets a lot of grid scale noise because it those divergent waves we talked about last time are not damped at all. You don't, they don't see, they don't trigger this feedback. So you can take the vorticity part and add to it a divergence part. And this is you know, a stupid thing to do, but it damps those modes out. So this is what we did back in 2008. And that model I showed, the two kilometer model that runs, it's the whatever, you know, 300 teragrid calculation runs because it has this scheme in it. So that scheme made it possible to zoom in, resolve some of the eddies, not others, and have a good stable simulation without having to tune that viscosity very carefully. I mean, is delta U star, I mean, is this thing is sort of singular long line and so on, or is it more broad? Um, it's extremely localized. Let me, let me come back to that in a second. So is this one. They're both very localized. Um, but we can do even better than that because we actually know that even though our models won't be quasi-geostrophic, because we said, you know, the isopycnals dip out and things like that. So we were a little worried about all the extra constraints of quasi-geostrophy. The eddies are pretty quasi-geostrophic. So what if we try and extend the 2D theory into a quasi-geostrophic theory, which brings potential vorticity into the story instead of just regular vorticity? You can do the same argument, except now you have a potential entropy cascade. You go through all the calculations, and this is, I showed this before, this is the numerical evidence from this simulation that it does the way what we expected it to do. And you get this same kind of a scaling again. Here's a viscosity, which is based on the gradient of the now potential vorticity. You can use this in a model that's not quasi-geostrophic, even though this is a quasi-geostrophic scaling, it doesn't matter. We just got to, it gives us a viscosity. You let's use that viscosity. And if the eddies have strong vorticity gradients, this thing will dampen. So it has that self-regularizing effect. Incidentally, the 
difference between the 2D version, Chuck Lee's version, and the QG version is just this one term, which is different between the two. And so even though the math was a lot more complicated to do this version, it ends up just having one correcting factor. The other advantage you get is, so we talked about that M dot and B dot in the momentum equation and the buoyancy equation. Because the potential vorticity ties together the buoyancy and the vorticity, you know, like we talked about the ice skater, you actually get a diffusivity as well as a viscosity predicted by this, and they should be equal to each other and equal to some other parameterization, which I'm not going to talk about. So that works pretty well. Here's what happens if you try it out in a series of models. If you don't resolve the instability scale <laughs> and you just have that kind of a model, it doesn't do very well, as you would imagine, but it doesn't blow up. You can still run the model with that. If you resolve the instability scale a little, this is the instability scale right here at this dash line. It still doesn't do that well, but once you get beyond that, this is actually four different five different simulations sitting on top of each other. They all have the same power spectrum as you go down because it's smart if you truncate here or you truncate here or you truncate here or you truncate here, but you have the same large scale forcing, the same epsilon cascade rate, it keeps the same power spectral slope. And this is the theoretical slope you had to assume to get there. It's a little bit steeper than that, but not too much. Okay, and so what are the other ones? Well, there's a Goldilocks problem. So if you use that one, it's okay. But if you use the Smagorinsky, which is inappropriate because this is a 3D energy cascade, they all pull down, it's too smooth. If you use the 2D, it's too noisy. <laughs> and if you use the quasi dystrophic, it's just right. Okay, so Goldilocks. What, all right, so here's the intermittency part. What does this viscosity field look like? So this is now a map of that viscosity's estimate of the local downscale cascade rate of potential entropy. It is not very uniform at all. This is a log scale. So it's jumping around by a couple orders of magnitude as to what the viscosity does. And it has some interesting vertical structure as well, which is complicated to think about. Um, I will, I will, I'll just say, if you do this in, the, in a real global model rather than an idealized model, you also get the same kind of behavior with spectral power. But then you get something else funny happening. If you plot what the dissipation rate is from point to point, it doesn't like, it comes out as a log normal distribution. So it's not only spatially variable in some kind of complicated spatial pattern, but if you sample from that, it's really close to log normal. And so log normal dissipation is something we would expect from 3D tiny scale turbulence. Log number sampling over the whole Earth, just every grid point. This is at a particular depth. Closely, it, and so it's a little different between the different parameterizations, but it's log normal even with a constant viscosity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know when the two models Yes. So that was sorry. Let me go back to that argument. So even though, even though. The model is not quasi-geostrophic or not two-dimensional. We can use the scalings from two-dimensional turbulence or quasi-geostrophic turbulence to give us a viscosity. And then we just use it. So we know the model has other, is doing other interesting things, but our scale analysis that we did on the first day tells us that those balances should be talking about the dominant terms in the equation. So we're not including all the fluid dynamics and the scaling and the viscosity. We're just doing a little bit of the story. Does that make sense? But we can use it in a 3D model. It doesn't blow up, which means that we got things sort of right. And again, if it did try to blow up, it has this regularizing effect. If it blows up, the first thing it would do is it would start having really strong fronts that would have big gradients in their vorticity. And so this would crank up and squash them. Okay. I'm going to go through the Goldilocks. 
So yeah, so this map has structure, like there's the Gulf Stream, you can see it. Here's the ACC, here's the Curcio. But if you just take all those grid points and plot them, it's approximately log normal. And so this is where we come back to Nigel's point about intermittency. We, oh, we have one more point to make first. Did this actually do anything to the energy budget? Yes, it does. So this is with a traditional constant viscosity closure. What are the main sinks of kinetic energy? Well, there's this horizontal dissipation, this like, you know, this thing that's the cascade to smaller scales that we're approximating with a the viscosity. There's the bottom drag, which is like a drag law, much like the roughness based one that Nigel was talking about. And then there's vertical mixing within the upper ocean. So the eddies would like to shear themselves out and you keep mixing them back to uniform with that wind driven vertical mix. That last one is the, by far the biggest. And most of it happens just within that boundary layer, but there's a little bit of vertical mixing below the boundary. Layer. So in the traditional model, number one, number two, number three, number four, in terms of sinks of kinetic energy. Now, this one, like Smagaransky, would have made everything too smooth. When we go to the, the Lee theory, this one drops by a lot. So now it's number one, Number two, bottom drag comes up because the currents have actually accelerated because they're less damped. Number three, number four. So this was second most important and now it's last in the list. And so the global kinetic energy budget, even in a high resolution eddy resolving model is sensitive to the subgrid scheme. Is the takeaway message from our perspective of like, do subgrids matter? They matter at leading order in the global budget of what's doing the damping of the kinetic energy. But now to come back to this log normality or approximate log normality, um, like we said, we use the epsilon, we played this fast and loose trick where we said that it's a global estimate of something that's homogeneous. Now we're gonna use a local estimate and something that's not homogeneous and that probably was a bad idea. But what kind of statistics does it have and it's not homogeneity? It looks like log normal distributions wherever you look. So if you take the whole world, you get this blue distribution and there's actually, you can, can't quite see, but there's a Gaussian fit to it underneath. So it's, you know, it has a little skewness. It's not quite Gaussian, but it's pretty damn close. And then if you zoom into this black box, which is just a random place on the earth, there's another one. And then if you zoom into the red box inside the black box, you get another one. And if you take all of the nine red boxes that fit in the black box and you look at their statistics, it gives you that kind of an uncertainty. So it is a self, it is a, a PDF which is repeating itself over and over again for energy dissipation. This looks an awful lot like 3D turbulence, except it's not homogeneous. It's very strongly inhomogeneous. You can see all the big currents. They are all higher sources. And if you were to zoom in on one particular frontal feature, it would have orders of magnitude more energy dissipation than everything else around it. So it's highly intermittent, like a log normal distribution or approximate log normal distribution is, but it also knows about geographic features. So it has this weird characteristic that it looks like something that would come out of a statistical theory. And you can push the argument the same way that Yalom did for after Kolmogorov, he said it's actually a cascade, it's a multiplicative cascade, and so you expect log normal energy dissipation. You can do the same thing here, except you're expecting log normal potential entropy dissipation, and then you work it back to energy, and it gives you, and you end up at the same place. So how, how is it different from scales from energy dissipation? Like if I, if I look at, say, that's why I think it's a great thing, it's Yeah. 
No, because even the big structures, their Reynolds number is like 10 to the sixth. So we're still extremely high, far, far, far away from the viscous effect. So the viscous like thing here is something like this cross scale transfer. That's so on the larger scales, it's the sapping of the energy. When, when you say and, the Reynolds number is 10 to 6, you're using the well, so with the Eddy renormalized viscosity, I said before, the numerical simulations will always be one because we that that is what keeps our model stable. So, so it is using the fluid viscosity it would be something like ten to the six would be a minimum we would see for this kind of flow. So it's not a low, it's not a laminar flow ever really in the way that we normally think of it, but it has these laminar like features because they're these persistent emergent phenomena in the face of all this mixing. And they're so like the jets on Jupiter, but there are other dynamics for other ones. And you know, some of these features you can see actually are kind of equatorial jets that have very similar dynamics. Yeah. But so the game is a lot of people go out and make observations of epsilon. And so you better get really lucky if you're going to get anything that's close to the average, because the average is way over here. The most likely value is way over here. So you'd be orders of magnitude off with a typical measurement. Or another way to put it is 90% of the energy is dissipated in only 10% of the ocean. And that 10% is these really big currents or really intense jets. Okay. Yeah. It's basically just log normal, but the log normal comes from this cas multiplicative cascade idea. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we can't, and we can't, we look a little bit into the details of the skewness and kurtosis and like does it vary with depth and things like that to try and give hints for the multifractal approach. And there've been a couple of papers written since ours trying to get at the multifractal aspect. Nobody has a clean explanation yet. And part of the problem is that a lot of the multifractal stuff happens in 3D dynamics. And we're, our whole argument is this is not 3D dynamics. This is quasi geostrophic quasi 2D dynamics. Right, and multifractal skeptic. Well, anyway, <laughs> well, someday people Don't will. Get more, yeah, yeah. Anyway, all right. So let's talk a little bit about the sub mesoscale. So that's our large eddy closure for the mesoscale part. We can use that for the mesoscale. Now the sub mesoscale is unresolved. What does it do? So the sub mesoscale is there because of the mixed layer. And I will show you that because remember we had this mixing turned on that was mixing up the mixed layer. If we turn off that mixing, that diurnal cycling, you lose the mixed layer pretty quickly. And when you lose the mixed layer, you lose the submesoscale. You start just getting mesoscale at the surface. So those little eddies existed because of this low stratification layer that was there because of the air sea fluxes and that forcing. If you let it run, let me just start that one more time. If you run it without, you get that. And not only that, the vertical buoyancy flux, the tendency to bring for the eddies to release potential energy that we talked about yesterday is rapidly decreasing in this case where we've turned off the mixing. So what's happening on this side is Potential energy is being injected by mixing. Potential energy is being injected by mixing. Potential energy is being injected by mixing. Eddies are taking the potential energy out and trying to re-stratify. Then you mix and then you re-stratify. You mix and you re-stratify. So it turns out, and that's all in the vertical velocity, which the mesoscale doesn't have any vertical velocity because everybody remembers we saw divergences and convergences, but only at the sub-mesoscale. So the sub-mesoscale has this particular property that it's very, very good at re-stratifying and extracting small scale potential energy through vertical flux. Unlike the mesoscale, which has really got this horizontal cascade process as its dominant effect. So that's gonna matter like crazy for our overall energy story because our heat capacity depends on how big, how deep this layer is, it's absorbing all the heat. So if there's a mixing restratification balance, some as a scale should be in there to play a role. Okay, so then you start saying, well, how accurate do we have to be? 
this is where you might get a little concern. So remember we said it's about, oh, actually I changed these numbers, but I somehow didn't on this slide. It's about a watt per meter squared, which would warm the atmosphere by 1.9 centigrade per year. It all stayed in the atmosphere, but it doesn't, it goes in the ocean. So if it only went in that part of the ocean that has the same heat capacity as the atmosphere, it'd be about one, two degrees per year. But actually this mixed layer is more like 10 times deeper than that. So it's like, you know, 2, 0.2 Kelvin per year is about what you get if you take global warming and try and warm up that mixed layer of the ocean. The seasons warm the mixed layer. This is just one location. This is ocean weather station Papa, which is in the middle of the North Pacific. And this is actually so important for the weather prediction of Canada and the United States. Before they had an autonomous mooring there, they used to park a ship at that location all the time. There was just a ship there monitoring the weather all the time because it was that valuable, that prediction. So anyway, now we have an autonomous buoy, but it means we have a very long record at this one location in the Pacific, which is great for climate studies. But if you go and you look at the typical cycle of the upper ocean temperature, it doesn't go by 0.2 Kelvin per year. It goes between about four and about 14. So it's 50 times bigger, the seasonal cycle, than global warming. So now you start might start getting very worried. <laughs> we can't accurately predict this whole thing at a level that you might get worried. And you can also see that there's a big seasonal cycle and how deep the well-mixed layer is. It goes all the way to here in winter and spring, all the way to here in winter, but only to here in summer. So this is a pretty hard problem. And so this is what the mixed layer looks like if you look at it varying season by season and location by location. This is from observation. So not surprisingly, if you look at climate models and you ask how deep is that layer, how well are you getting that mixing restratification balance right? Here's the observation for winter and summer. Here the, here's the climate model bias. Way, way, way too deep here. A little bit too shallow here. Most places hashed, which means indeterminate sign. Some models are too deep, some models are too shallow over most of the earth. In the summertime, pretty consistent, too shallow, okay? So, and some of these models have a parameterization of the sub mesoscale and some don't. There's a lot of diversity in that. And so when you think about maybe this layer is gonna change and maybe that heat capacity is gonna change in the future, you start wondering like, can we actually do this part of the problem? So let me talk a little bit about how we parameterize the sub mesoscale piece. Then we'll jump to the how, whether we can improve the mixing part of this story. And then I'm gonna try and close on can we quantitatively relate those mismatches to how much they affect the energy budget? So this is this prototypical process of sub mesoscale eddies slumping over a front. So it's warm on one side and cold on the other. And if you think like, so here we have a warm and cold, and if it wants to do this, and then it comes to mix, like this side is showing diurnal mixing as well. If it tips over, now it's got to mix through the stratification that was previously just a horizontal gradient. You get some vertical part. So that's the process. They're tipping over these fronts on average. And when they do that, it's extracting potential energy. And then when you go to mix, it doesn't mix as much. Whereas if you stay like this, there's no extraction of potential energy and there's actually more injection of potential energy because now you're mixing into an unstratified fluid. So the process you want is a rate of overturning of fronts. So you can run a whole mess of models like this, hundreds of them, and examine their behavior. And what they do is if you don't have that mixing part turned on, this is the stratification measured in buoyancy frequency, but basically more stratified is up, less stratified is down. For a little while, they're kind of deciding what to do. Then the eddies get finite amplitude and off they go. They restratify, they tip over that front. And then it happens when they reach finite amplitude. And this is actually superimposing a bunch of different models at different resolutions. So you shouldn't worry that those models are resolved enough to get this effect. So what does this look like in power spectrum? This is the linear instability scale. And for many of orders of magnitude, that's a good prediction. 
But when we get to this part where it starts re-stratifying, it's actually not at that scale anymore. It's much bigger. So there's an inverse energy cascade going on during the restratification process. So we better not use our linear instability length scale anywhere in the theory for how fast we restratify. Oh, this would be a K to minus three at the end. So this is looking quasi geostrophic and then um, ish. K to minus two, K to minus three, depending on whether the mixing is on or not. Okay, so we don't want to use linear instability ingredients. And there's a way to grab a vertical structure out of this that I'm not going to talk about because it's kind of weird. But anyway, you can figure out what the vertical structure should be like. So we put these ingredients together. We start with this. Okay, it's something to do with finite amplitude. How strong do those eddies get? They tend to grow until their kinetic energy rivals the front they're growing from. So if we know the strength of that original front, we can guess how strong the eddies are going to get. This turns out to be the weakest part of the whole theory. <laughs> I can tell you later. Um, So the eddies are moving stuff across the front, but also up and down. And the length scale that their vertical excursions are going tends to get up to the boundary layer depth and then saturate at that boundary layer depth. So they are sensitive to how deep the boundary layer depth is. If it's deeper, they have bigger vertical excursions. And since we're talking about a W prime, B prime, lifting of dense stuff, pushing a dense stuff down and lifting up light stuff, that vertical excursion scale is important. And then the angle at which they transport stuff is at half the slope. That's kind of a complicated one for why it comes into theory, but it does. Okay, so we'd like to predict this rate of restratification, which is also the same thing as the rate of change of potential energy as we saw from the energy budget we talked about yesterday. And so we can just simply mind it different and say it's the change of potentially over change in time, or it's just delta buoyancy, delta Z, delta time, which is just converting that with the same rules that we saw yesterday. So we just, what if we just say what they're doing is just grabbing some stuff down here and taking it up there. So we do that. We can just say they could either take stuff from this side and move it sideways, or they could take stuff at the bottom and move it up. But either way, they could affect the potential energy. The slope relating this effect to this effect has a particular scaling that basically says the eddies know what direction the isopycnals are. And if as they slope down, they're going farther in the horizontal than in the vertical. That's this part. The time scale in this extraction rate is the turbulent turnover time scale that goes along with the eddies. So a, a length scale over a velocity. And then we saturate that eddy velocity scale at the scale of the, at the speed that that front goes, which just depends on how strong the hot to cold is. We know the vertical scale because we saw it saturated at the boundary layer depth. That's the next piece. And that's it. So this is the parameterization we get for the rate of restratification. It depends on the boundary layer depth squared, and it depends on the horizontal strength of that front squared. And then there's a Coriolis parameter that comes in from the thermal wind part. So not terribly complicated. Does it do anything? Well, we don't just want this part of it. We also want a horizontal part, and so we model it actually as an overturning of the front, like a stream function kind of thing, which is just a little more geometry. This is what it looks like if you try and simulate one of those um, little toy simulations. This is the diagnosed overturning stream function and the diagnosed overturning isopycnals as it tilts. And that's what the parameterization does over that side. And this is monitoring the stratification and the this side versus that side, and you can see it's a pretty decent match. So it gets the scaling laws right, essentially. Okay, so we take that thing and we plug it into a climate model. What does it do? What's your guess? What does it do to the boundary layer depth? If it's restratifying more, what do you think? 
You make it shallower, just make it deeper. <laughs> I think I heard it. somebody say shallower. Yes, it's shallower. So if there's a competition between mixing, which would make the boundary layer deeper and deeper and deeper, and restratification, and this accelerates restratification, it should make this boundary layer shallower. And so it turns out that when we put it into a lot of models, many of them had this really deep wintertime mixed layer problem that we talked about that was up there in the, in the northern part of the ocean. And if you turn it on, it makes that a lot better. So we, that parameterization parameterizes is a process that's apparently very active in the northern oceans during winter time, which reduces the bias between observations and climate models pretty substantially. What, why what physically going on? So we have a well-mixed layer that has isopycnals looking like this. So we might have light and dense. And this, we would think it would fall over in a non-rotating fluid, but in a rotating fluid, there will be a jet going this way that has a Coriolis force that keeps propping it up. So these eddies allow that front to meander and tilt over and extract the energy and then restratify the upper ocean. So the eddies are breaking the balance of geostrophic balance on the large scale and allowing fronts to tip over. And that means that it brings the boundary layer a little bit shallower, like about 10% shallower. So, okay, 10% shallower is something we'll hold in mind. And so this is an example of boundary layer depth in a high resolution model. And this is what happens when you turn the parameterization on. All of these little fronts are getting very shallow boundary layers because they're all tipping over. And that's the kind of thing that we're trying to simulate. And I already talked about this. So I'm not gonna talk about that. So what else does the climate model do? You put this thing in, it makes the boundary layer 10% less deep. Okay, whatever. Maybe that doesn't matter. Maybe nothing else changes. Well, it turns out that that actually has a pretty substantial impact on Arctic and Antarctic sea ice extent. Because you change that boundary layer and you change the processes that melt and refreeze to get at the Arctic ice. And then the Arctic ice affects the albedo, affects the air sea heat flux, and that has a big feedback on climate. It actually pretty substantially changes, so the red and blue here are with the parameter station, the green is without, the amount of variability in the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation, which is a big thing because that affects the weather of Europe substantially. And now we're talking about trying to get energy and carbon into the ocean. Is there a way we can detect whether it changes those kind of phenomena in a sensible way? Well, the easiest way to do it is actually, so the chlorofluorocarbons, things like aerosols and that kind of stuff, they don't exist in nature. We know how much we've made every year since they were invented. And so we actually know the atmospheric concentration for all, whatever, about 80 years now since they were originally invented. They can be measured because they're very weird chemicals all throughout the ocean depth. And they're another dissolved gas that gets uptaken by the ocean alongside carbon dioxide or alongside heat and we get transported down. So this is a map showing with this sub-mesoscale parameterization, the bias, so the mismatch of modeled CFC concentrations in the ocean versus without it. So essentially the water that's going down and making its way into the deep ocean is doing a better job of representing the dissolved gases when you include this process, at, at least those two different locations. Okay, so that's, so now we've got mesoscale handled because we know how to do a smagarinsky like horizontal closure. We've got sub-mesoscale restratification rate handled. There's a lot of other interesting stuff that sub-mesoscale does to oil and all that other stuff we talked about. We've skipped all that. We're just worried about this boundary layer depth impact. What about mixing? Can we do better than we used to do with mixing? And would that have an impact? Let me rewind to this boundary layer depth bias because I want to show you one piece. So in the wintertime hemisphere, boundary layers were too deep and it helped. They got less deep. In the summertime hemisphere, boundary layers were too shallow. And this makes them shallower still. 
So there's something else going on. So we've now increased the restratification. And in some places, it's making things too shallow. So maybe we should reevaluate whether the mixing was right. So we go to that process. <laughs> and one of the things that was mixing, missing and mixing at the time when we were looking at this was wave-driven mixing, which I talked about how the Stokes shear force can accelerate the downward processes and the Langmuir cells and all this extra stuff. So can we parameterize that process in a meaningful way, put it in a climate model and see how much it deepens the boundary layer. And so it's the same process that we saw. We ran all these simulations to try and get a better handle on how it works. You can take pictures of them. These things really exist. Okay, so. Oh yeah, to even recognize what it was. So this is Rhode Island. That's, no, I don't even know which piece of land, but anyway, these stripes of foam are Langmuir cells and here's the wave crests perpendicular to them. Kind of similar to the oil picture, but a little less disturbing because it's not an oil spill. <laughs> okay. A friend took that from an airplane as he was taking off and he was like, oh, you got to see the Langmuir cells. Anyway. Okay. So the turbulent phenomena are only pretty. They accumulate sub mesoscale systematically restratifies. We expect this extra wave driven mix mixing will systematically deepen. So that will affect the boundary layer depth. The boundary layer in turn is what filters the exchange of CFCs we just saw, but also energy, carbon, momentum, everything between the atmosphere and the ocean. So it's gonna have a climate feedback that way. And in the end, we're gonna come back to a way to put all those pieces together. So Langmuir turbulence is one example which energizes the boundary layer turbulence. So it should enhance entrainment and mixing within the mixed layer. So, oh, I think I have a few slides about this, which we saw yesterday. So remember, we have these cells, they're forced downward by this Stokes shear force, this fancy thing that comes in from the wave to turbulence coupling. I better not have too many of these slides, I don't. Okay, so we parameterize the rate of Stokes shear force enhancement of turbulence. And it says basically when you have strong waves, you get more mixing, which is not so surprising. It depends a little bit on the frequency of the waves as well. So long waves are less effective than short waves because it's really the Stokes shear that matters. Um, so that's an interesting prospect. Then you go to a climate model and you say, well, where do we get the wave information from? Climate models aren't simulating waves. So then you take a wave model like they use for operational wave forcing at no forecasting at NOAA, you couple it in as a new component into the climate model system, and then you can extract the wave information you want. So not surprisingly, that's like a 10 year process to get all of those pieces in the chain hooked together. This is the summary slide at the end. <laughs> okay, so we ran the LES, we got the scaling, we coupled the wave model in, we got that piece out, and now does it work? Does it do anything? So this table is showing us summertime and wintertime RMS error in the boundary layer depth. So this is global south of 30 south. So like down here, just the Southern Ocean. This is tropics, global south, 30 south, and then tropics in winter, so summer, winter, just numbers. So I'll guide you through the numbers. Here's the end game. If we do our best job that we possibly can do with all of the LES and all of the scaling, everything we've done, we improve the RMS error by about 15, 20% in summertime. And we don't do any worse in winter. So remember, I just said that the sub mesoscale does a lot in winter and in summertime made things too shallow. So now, because this wave driven mixing depends on different things, it doesn't have this, the negative effect. It's not like we went plus one and now we're minus one. In the summertime, it's mixing more. In the wintertime, it's not changing the answer. And so we end up improving both hemispheres at the same time by that kind of a balancing process between different processes. Um, <laughs> if you don't know what you're doing along the way, we didn't, you can make this problem a lot worse. And so every single one got worse when we used our first idea of how to do entrainment. So that actually is bad. Okay, so here we go. So now we have highlighted different ways you can improve the viscosity scheme to get the eddies working right, the way they're supposed to work. 
And then we've taken all the small scales that weren't resolved and really focused attention on that boundary layer, whether it's making it shallower or making it deeper with depending different seasons, different forcing. We now know that waves could affect it. We know that fronts could affect it, et cetera, et cetera. We put all this information in to try and get at the boundary layer. And it's because we think that that boundary layer is the capacitor for the heat capacity of this uptake. It's also the thing that's well mixed and has the, takes up the carbon, takes up all of those pieces. Okay, so here's where the Nobel Prize comes in. <laughs> so Hasselin has this theory that the temperature change of the upper ocean should be some kind of atmospheric forcing and plus global warming is that extra one watt per meter squared with the heat capacity that scales with the mixed layer depth and some restoring force. And that's a Nobel Prize winning very simple equation. <laughs> and what it does is it reddens the effect. So if we turn off the restoring, it basically we get a red spectrum when our atmospheric forcing was a white spectrum. So the ocean responds to the slow parts more than it responds to the fast parts. Well, that's why we saw those movies. That's not a surprise. We got that piece. There's a different amount of low frequency response depending on how much restoring you have. This is restoring back to climatological temperature anomaly equals zero. So that's maybe not surprising. Either. If you believe Claude and Klaus's estimate, this is the, the very simple formula for what that time scale should be. <laughs> but anyway, it's, they say it's about two months. So that's close to this version. So the reddening is out here kind of in the higher frequency end more than in the lower frequency end. But anyway, we're going to have to do something a little more complicated. So that's not the only simplified version of how the ocean responds to climate change. A lot of people, particularly paleoclimate people, will tell you that the more important thing is the sinking in the northern oceans of the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation. And we know from paleoclimate that sometimes this stops and then particularly the beginning of ice ages. So they are big into the way that the oceans respond to climate is this thing is variable. And then actually there is a very complicated overturning in the Southern ocean as well. that's wind driven. And we know that this thing is really interesting because the ozone hole up here actually has changed the winds over the Southern ocean. So we've been doing a multi-decade experiment on how the ocean responds to changing winds by healing, first causing, and then healing the ozone hole, which has changed this part of the world in a pretty substantial way. So we've done a natural experiment, to, and we know that this affects the, the, the uptake of heat and carbon in the Southern Ocean, the response to that change in winds. Okay, so maybe Hasselman's model is a little too simple because it doesn't know anything about this. It doesn't know anything about this. But there's a middle ground between these two, which is suppose you don't have just a surface temperature like this, and you don't have this geographic complexity of like north and south, <laughs> which is not that much geographic complexity, but you do say there's a surface temperature and there's a deep temperature. Can we make an equation set that's almost as simple as Hasselman's, but just says, what's the temperature of the surface ocean and what's the temperature of the deep ocean? And I don't care too much about the process, but I'm gonna allow them to exchange temperature sometimes. And you can, it's called the two layer homogeneous energy balance model it's from Jonathan Gregory about 20 years ago. And these are the equations. So it looks an awful lot like Hasselman. It's got a rate of change of surface temperature with some heat capacity. It's got a rate of change of deep temperature with some deep heat capacity. It's got the surface forcing from the atmosphere and there's now not a mixed layer depth here. It's hidden on that side. There's a restoring back to anomaly of zero. And then there's a, some complicated thing here, but look, it's just the temperature difference surface to deep. And then there's the balancing part. So the deep ocean is taking up almost everything that that's giving up. This coupling coefficient, we don't know what it is. It's something that was, represents that overturning in the Southern Ocean and the Northern Hemisphere or something like that. And then there's this little epsilon, which is called efficacy. And so the atmospheric scientists say this is totally wrong. This is not the way to understand how Hasselman's model goes wrong. What they say is if you have a temperature anomaly in the surface ocean, the clouds change and change the incoming radiation part. And the oceanographers say, no, no, if we had an anomaly in the surface ocean, it's going to follow that overturning circulation and end up in the deep ocean later. 
So if this epsilon was one, you would be purely with the oceanographers, all the temperature anomalies eventually end up in the deep ocean. And if that epsilon was infinity, you'd be purely with the atmospheric people and it would go, it would, all the responses would go upward to the atmosphere. And you wouldn't have any deep heating or cooling. So it's a tunable parameter between the atmospheric cloud-based response and the ocean energy uptake response. And if you want to think about it this way, it's do we do this one and this one, outgoing long, you know, outgoing stuff up to the space, or do we do this one where we're exchanging heat with the deep ocean? Both of those are viable ways to get heat out of the surface ocean. Okay. And this epsilon controls it. Okay, so this model has a big problem, which is not only is it too simple, it probably is too simple, but there's one parameter that's like the heat capacity of this upper layer. We don't really know what that upper layer represents because it's too, you know, it's some global mean of something. We kind of think it's something like that mixed layer, but we don't know. Then there's a heat capacity of the deep ocean. You could maybe argue that those two, their ratio should be like the depth of one to the other. So there is some kind of exchange between the two. There's this parameter, the restoring parameter, which like we said with the Hasselman has a wide range of possible values, but it's not really observable because in this coupled system, it's not alone. There's the efficacy, which also is a tunable parameter, but it's not observable. And then there's the gamma, which represents those overturning circulations. But this is such a simplified form that we actually don't, we can't measure it either. So the problem with this model is we can't measure it. We can't measure any of the parameters in it. So what can we do? Well, in the old days, we would have said, oh, it's not a very good model. Or let's just idealize, let's do a you know, parameter search, but it's actually got six parameters. So it's a six dimensional parameter space, which is kind of hard to explore fully, whatever. In modern times, what we do is we do something like a machine learning based regression on all of those parameters. And so what we do is we take those six parameters and we examine how they vary by fitting it to the whole ensemble of all the climate models that are run for the IPCC. And there's a fast time scale response, which is sort of like the surface ocean part. And so you fit the parameters to best optimize that. And there's a slow time scale response, which involves exchanges with the deep oceans. You fit that slow time scale response and you do that over and over again for every climate model. So now we have a way that we can at least say, what's the best fit of this model to any particular climate model? But we're still missing the link to the processes we were talking about. Where are the small scales in that? Somehow implicit. So boundary layer depth was our key indicator of small scale process representation. What if we just take the boundary layer depth globally and ask if that's related to these parameters? And turns out that was our first idea because we were like, hey, this is gonna, this is the boundary layer. You know, that's like Hasselman's idea was that surface boundary layer, when it got deeper, that heat capacity would go up. It actually doesn't work at all. That's not actually, a, that model has no predictive skill. But if you then step back and say, oh, we saw something interesting happening in the Southern Ocean. There was complicated phenomena going on there in that boundary layer. Sometimes it was too shallow, sometimes it was too deep. The waves did a lot of mixing down here. The submesoscale did not do as much. Up here in the Northern Ocean, submesoscale was doing a lot, but only in winter time. And then in the tropics, it's something different entirely. So if you take those, boundary layer depths in those three regions and then ask how these parameters depend on these three boundary layer depths, you get something very interesting happening. So this is just showing what a time series would be like in a simple model. This is the temperature change of the whole ensemble of all the, all the complicated climate models. And so they have the early time and then the late time. You fit each of them with a full parameter set of this. And then you um, examine in each model what their boundary layers were doing. And here's the one more wrinkle that I want to put on you. It wouldn't be very interesting if we had to know what the boundary layer depth was 
in the distant future, like 2,000 years in the future. So we restrict ourselves to not know anything except for the initial condition for the boundary layers. And the idea being that if a model is doing a good job of boundary layer depth prediction at the beginning, it's got good physics and it's probably going to have good boundary layer depth the whole time. That is, you know, a simple idea. Okay. So what happens if you do that? Well, here are the here's the correlations between the tropical ocean and that efficacy parameter that's like looking up or looking down for a response. And it's not a great relationship, but it definitely has a relationship. Here's the Southern Ocean mixed layer and actually a different measure of climate sensitivity going like this. Again, there's a relationship between that boundary layer depth in that region and different parameters within this model. And then up here, you can't see it, but if this is the Northern Ocean, and that upper ocean, lower ocean exchange parameter. So like that overturning circulation would be more, less, whatever. Okay. And then if you correlate where in the ocean temperature change, so up, energy uptake correlates with this same parameter, you see things that look interesting to oceanographers. I know this looks like just weird garbage to everybody else, but basically the fact that this is a coherent pattern and each of them is different means we're kind of the Southern Ocean boundary layer, the tropical ocean and the Northern Ocean boundary layers are tweaking different parts of the warming potential. So it looks physical, this correlation. It's not a spurious effect. Okay, so that's part one. Now, can we use this information to actually improve the climate model ensemble prediction? So those, those climate models had a big scatter of temperatures. Can we somehow use this correlation to work it backwards? So it turns out this model works really well. It predicts the warming of each climate model within about 10%. So that's not our biggest problem. We can reproduce the model with the tuned version of this. And then unlike the parameters over here, so what did I say was the problem with these? None of these parameters are observable. The boundary layer depth is observable. So if we know how these parameters vary depending on boundary layer, and if we put the observed value of the boundary layer in, we can correct each of those parameters within each of the fit, fitted models into the observed range. Essentially saying this model over here is too big on this parameter. Let's correct it back to here. This model over here is too big on this parameter. Let's correct it over to there. This model over here is too big on this parameter. Let's correct it over there. This is, and we correct them all into the observed range. And now we have a new ensemble, not of climate models. We didn't touch the original climate models, but we have a new ensemble of climate model emulators using this Hasselman style energy balance model. Does that make sense to everybody? So we fit an emulator to the climate models. We examine how the parameters of that emulator vary based on an observable, because the parameters in the emulator themselves are not observable. We then use the observed values to correct the emulator parameters. And now we have a new ensemble. Yeah. Yes, I'm gonna give you an example in just a second. So let's think what the possibilities are. This correction could make the whole ensemble predict more warming. It can make the whole ensemble predict less warming. It can make the whole ensemble have a bigger uncertainty, or it can make the whole ensemble have a smaller uncertainty, or it could do some combination. Does that make sense? Okay, what does it do? This is what it does. It reduces the uncertainty in the projections in the near term by about 20% and in the long term by about 40%. And so what this is saying is that if we, if this is correct, then this relationship between the emulator and the climate model is correct. If we went back to the climate models and we did more science of the kind that we have been doing to improve those boundary layers and got the boundary layers to within observed values on all the climate models, the ensemble spread would be much narrower. So does everybody sort of understand what I mean? <laughs> yeah. 
This is two different climate model projections. One is for a 1% per year increase of CO2, which is sort of similar to a realistic one. And this is abrupt quadrupling of CO2 in at the first instant. And this lighter shaded one is what the climate models actually do. And then this darker shaded one is what the corrected climate model ensemble does. It is a narrower window. The uncorrected climate model ensemble actually is very similar to the whole climate model spread by design. And in fact, we don't even have the climate models out here to the year 4,000, but we're using an uncorrected ensemble versus a corrected ensemble to think about the deep time pieces of the story. I guess I understand how, how you, you're narrowing the climate models because you're being more selective. We have, we have, we have emulated the climate models with a simpler model that's based on Hasselman. We have corrected the emulators based on the relationship between the boundary layer depths and the emulator parameters. And so the narrowed ensemble is the corrected emulator ensemble. So we're essentially saying if this relationship between the emulators and the climate models is a good one, and we have reason to believe it is, and if that relationship between boundary layer depths in those three regions and emulator parameters is correct, which we think it is because we actually scatter beyond it. It's a, a narrowing rather, we're not extrapolating to get there, we're interpolating. Then we would expect that the climate models were we to somehow fix their boundary layer depths would be narrower ensemble. So this boundary layer actually does play a critical role through this in the circuitous route in setting the climate sensitivity, which is the key parameter for how much carbon dioxide you emit, how much warmer do you get? So, and then this is where, so here's the, here are the details. So using these correlations and then observations to correct, we revise the ensemble mean and narrow the 66% range of equilibrium climate sensitivity from 4.51 warming from three to 5.71 to 4.66. The mean goes up a little, but not much, but this range gets reduced by about 40%. And so this is where this quotation from the economist comes in. Approximately having, so 40%, maybe having 20%, half of half, whatever. The transient climate response, that's the short-term one, has a net present value of $10 trillion. If you can do it in time <laughs> for the emissions to be adjusted. And it falls to 9.7 trillion if you can get it done by 2030. So what this means is, is the thing that was preventing climate reductions was the uncertainty in that projected warming. If you can reduce the uncertainty, it reduces, it enhances the cause for action by a substantial amount. So I'm not willing to say we've solved this problem yet, but we've at least put a chips on the board to say that better ocean processes in the upper boundary layer having to do from small scale processes do play a role, at least in this emulated version of climate change. And that emulated version should actually push us toward doing something different about climate, which has trillions of dollar value. So yes, that's... that's <laughs> That's it. <laughs> yes, but let's have questions because there should be a lot. No, you can't do that. So we can't do data assimilation in a couple climate model. Yes, so this is effectively like this is a parameter uh, adjustment of the emulators. Not of the climate models themselves. People have been trying to do parameter adjustment of the climate models, but the degrees of freedom are too high and the time scales between the atmosphere and ocean are too disparate for any of our present data assimilation technology to work. So we can't do it in the full system. In this emulator system, they're trivial. They're linear coupled ODEs. We can do it. We did it in a, by five different methods and we got pretty much the same answer. You could have used something fancier. You could have used a fancier emulator if you want, no problem. But the point is, is if you go through the intermediary of the emulator and then back, 
the implications are that the emulator is telling us we could do a lot better with the climate models than we do. That uncertainty is not irreducible. It actually, we could improve processes and improve the uncertainty. And that improved uncertainty would actually lead to things. And not only that, but it's the boundary layer depth is a key part yeah, of that story. So that's where it goes. So many things so many things feed into so many things, but you would have guessed based on this simple energy budget and Hasselman's original conjecture, this thing has to has to matter. But it doesn't matter as simply as we thought at first, we had to break it up to different regions before it started to work. And it's interesting that actually the Northern Ocean and the Southern Ocean have opposite impacts. If you're too deep in the North, you warm the ocean more. And if you're too deep in the South, you cool more, which is like, has to do with the geometry of Earth and all kinds of things. But anyway, that's it. Other questions? Please. <laughs> yeah. Your treatment of thinking about the lower, um, over a deeper ocean as a smoother of the, as of the upper mixed layer, just like how the ocean is losing, how the mixed layer is losing the most zero signal. I'm wondering why. What's the physical basis for assuming this? Does it shall we assume a time scale separation of the motion and to, to arrive at this? So it's this, it's this kind of a process. So there's a direct connection everywhere in the world between the atmosphere and the ocean and the boundary layer. Like and so even on a time scale of days, they're responding one to the other. But actually, this overturning to fill up the deep ocean and that overturning to fill up the deep ocean are extremely rare. The volume of water represented by the surface signature of where it occurs are inversely proportional. So the biggest volume of water is caused in the smallest area places. And so there's some other ocean process involving these few locations that are special that's quite different from what's going on in the surface all the time. And so the idea is, is that those processes are much more sensitive to long time scale, slower variability. So it's a low pass filter, like the upper ocean is a low pass filter in the atmosphere. This is still another low pass filter to the deep ocean. So it's the mixed layer, the low pass filter to the deep. The, the, the deep ocean is the slowest. The mixed layer is the intermediate and the atmosphere is the fastest. Yeah. Yeah, actually that reminds me of how yeah, and so when you do a, a, a shock jump like this, where you inject a bunch of CO2, you see a fast time scale of response and then a slow time scale of response. And that's just from easily fit by those equations. So essentially, if you saw this fast time scale and then slower time scale, you might guess a system like that was a simple approximator and that's kind of what it is. Is there a question back there? Yes? Oh, what's the value of epsilon? Um, I I don't have that table. I can tell you what the value of epsilon is. Hold on. That's a good question. Let me find it. Oh, and this, sorry, people on Zoom are not seeing me browse through here. But anyway. So epsilon is, so this is not the value of epsilon itself, but this is showing you how much it changes. So it's changing with the global ocean mix layer by 0.4 units, it's getting bigger. Um, and then it's the Northern ocean, if the mix layer gets deeper in the Northern ocean, epsilon actually gets smaller. If the mixed layer in the tropical ocean gets deeper, epsilon gets bigger, and then it's uh, somewhat less responsive to the Southern Ocean. 
So it's changing up and down in response to those changing boundary layers. But do I have an actual listing of what the average value of epsilon is? I think I might in the supplementary material, but I don't, can't find it at this moment. Exactly. So whether you consider the overturning or the, oh, actually, I think it may be hidden in this figure. Let me go back and look at this one figure. Yeah, so here are the values of epsilon. So here's one, and all of them are bigger than one, but the ones that have the deepest tropical ocean are more bigger than one than the ones that have a shallower tropical ocean. And similarly for Northern Ocean and Southern Ocean, it varies up and down depending on their boundary layer depths. And so if you went to this and just took the median value, it would be about one and a quarter, suggesting that it would be um, that like 25% of the excess energy in the upper ocean would actually be resolved by the atmosphere and clouds, whereas the rest of it would go to the deep ocean. That's a good question. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so we can simulate not only the oceans, but other things with them as well. And so that the mixing scheme, the boundary layer mixing, you can test that in oceans and lakes. It's not quite the same because in the ocean problem, there's salinity. So that, that's one big difference, but the temperature side can be tested in, in lakes. Um, the Actually in the lake problem, they were way ahead of the oceanographers in, in terms of implementing the Langmuir mixing because they knew that they could not get lake dynamics to work right without it. In, in a lake or in a pond, um, they're much more, they get lateral injection of stuff. And then what sets the stratification is just mixing and restratification. There's not any complicated currents or other stuff like there is in the ocean. So it's really a homogeneous situation. And they were like, how deep does it go? And how does it restratify with solar and other effects? And so they saw the value of the Langmuir piece of this story earlier than oceanographers did for that reason, because it was so easy to, it was a less complex system. Yeah. Yes. So that boundary layer mixing um, is partly caused by convection and partly caused by winds and waves. Um, the convective part is really critical in wintertime. So the cooling of the surface, because the atmosphere is colder than the ocean, is a big part of explaining why the wintertime mixed layer is much, much deeper than the summertime. In the summertime, the warming of the surface actually has the opposite effect. It suppresses the turbulence in the surface. And so both of those phases are really important for getting that boundary layer right. Plus in the diurnal cycle that we show, saw in the submesoscale test case, it's nighttime convection that preserves the existence of the boundary layer for the submesoscales to live in. If you turn off the nighttime convection, that boundary layer goes away very quickly. So yes, there's a lot of different pieces of convection in this story. Um, and I think, you know, improving convection is one of the ways you could try and improve this boundary layer depth prediction, which would then goes through the climate sensitivity and so on and so forth all the way to the end. Good question, Nick. Yeah. No, so that's that's important. Um, that's an important and interesting difference. So we use the potential vorticity theory to derive the viscosity and GM coefficient and diffusivity scalings. Here they are. But actually, we use those closures in a full hydrostatic Boussinesque model that has nothing to do with potential vorticity dynamics except as a derived quantity. So we're using these in the full equation set. But since we knew that the eddies that are doing this cascade are pretty well in the asymptotic regime, we thought that using that 
theory might give us numbers that were in the right ballpark. So that's the idea. So it wouldn't have been as important of a result if we had built a quasi-geostrophic theory that works in quasi-geostrophic models. This is a quasi-geostrophic theory that works in Boos and S models. So it's a much more, that it, when you put it in the more complicated system with more degrees of freedom that it doesn't fail to work is a bigger, a harder challenge. Like, so in Boos and S models, there are also internal gravity waves. It might have been that the internal gravity waves blew up and crashed the whole thing because we ignored them in the development of this theory. But since we had that experience with the 2D closure, we already thought it was going to work a little, and then we could at least correct it if we needed to. And so, yeah, it's it's a it's a, that's the bigger challenge. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. I mean, this can certainly be improved upon. Like that's the other thing. This is absolutely not consistent with the intermittency piece that Nigel talked about. Um, nor, you know, all of the parameterizations we're using are just toy versions of those real interesting phenomena. So, and as we saw at the end, even small corrections to the boundary layer depth might actually have a big impact on the climate model. So we need to get a lot better. I mean, another way, to, ooh, sorry, I gotta go through Goldilocks again. Um, another way to read those scatter plots at the end This is a pretty model, but I hesitated to put the slide in because it's, it's hard to fast forward to. <laughs> you have to watch the movie before you can go. But another way to read those scatter plots at the end showing the different parameters was, my gosh, we do a bad job of modeling the boundary layer. <laughs> um, like, they, those models should not have been as different as they are on the boundary layer depth. And I should just jump out of this and go to the end. Do, do, do. I mean, look at these. This is the observed range. That's the model spread. So it's like the scatter is five or maybe even 10 times bigger than the observed range. In this one, there's only two models out of about 30 that fall in the observed range. In this one, there's only two. And in that one, there's quite a few, maybe five or six, but it's not the same models in the three cases. <laughs> so nobody, none of the models are in all three in the observed range consistently. So all of the models are biased in one or the other of these regions in their boundary layer depth. So there's lots of room to improve. All of these pieces we were talking about would have improved or had the potential to improve that, that metric. All right. <laughs> I'm also interested in how the journal cycle affects the, the generation of edits. Maybe there's a wild guess that I'm wondering whether there could be a resonance, for example, for exciting frequencies. For example, we have a, a penetration mixing and then recovery. This is like an oscillator, but maybe that's. I mean, there is a paper that hypothesizes essentially that, that they say that, there, that the intermittent mixing actually causes a larger response from the eddies than steady mixing, but it's still somewhat speculative. There's, as we saw, the eddy restratification occurs after they've become finite amplitude and after they have a broadband energy spectrum. So they no longer really have a key defining frequency. And so if they were still their linear instability selves and had one frequency to resonate with, that might work, but they're pretty broadband by the time they're doing that restratification. So I'm skeptical, but it's not, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It's just sort of, it's not, it's not obvious that there might be such a thing. If they were more wave-like, I would, if, if the response was push down and then a wave pops you back up, then I would say, oh yeah, there definitely should be a resonance, but it's not as simple as that. Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks for all of your attention this week. I look forward to hearing more from everybody. And I'm also happy to talk whenever um, in informal times about more of this or other things.